Hi, you guys. You're listening to Good Vibe Sunday, a podcast brought to you by I Am Warhol, the blog. Every Sunday, I'll be sitting down with provocative thinkers, industry disruptors, and culture changers. My intention for every guest is to talk about breaking barriers, shifting old paradigms, and really just opening up in a vulnerable conversation. Our guest today is Kevin Kuzminoff. He was drafted by the Cleveland Indians as a third baseman. He went on to play for teams such as the San Diego Padres, the Oakland A's, the Kansas City Royals, the Colorado Rockies, the Miami Marlins, and then ended his career with the Texas Rangers. Kuzminoff was born in Newport Beach, California. He grew up in Evergreen, Colorado, and he made his big league debut with the Indians in 2006. One of Kuzminoff's gloves from the 2009 season with the Oakland A's is in the Hall of Fame because he held the highest fielding percentage of all third basemen of all time. He also became the first player in the history of baseball to hit a grand slam on his very first major league pitch. The story that I've been told about Kuz was when he was in the clubhouse, just to give you an idea of what kind of person Kuzminoff is, he was in the clubhouse and he knew that one of his teammates really loved donuts. And so he would go every day uh, knowing that they would be given donuts and he'd take a bite of each donut just so his friend, Nick Green, his teammate would come in to find that each donut was bitten and he would just, you know, instantly know it was Kuz. So he just really kept everything very light from all the stories that I've heard about him. Kuzminov says that we must work hard to achieve our goals, that there's no way around making ourselves uncomfortable and showing up every day ready to give it all we've got. But he also agrees that there's a time where you just have to trust your hard work is going to pay off and pull you through the rest of the way. So at which point you just let go. And if you don't make it, at least you walk away with no regrets and knowing that you gave it all you've got. If I don't make it, I just, I just, I couldn't make it, you know? Mm -hmm. And, but I can't blame it on the process. You know, I can't blame it on the work, you know, or the lack of, of work that I wasn't willing to put into. You know, if you're not willing to train hard and push yourself and train the right way and you go out and you fail, yeah, you should have no reason to get upset. You didn't put the work in. You know, and, and so I'm coaching at Metro State here in Denver, which is D2 school, and I go down there every day and, and all these kids get pretty upset. I'm like, what are you upset about? Right. You're, not, you're, you're not putting the work in. Kuz also probes at the idea behind the term big leaguing. And he says that when being pulled in so many different directions by people's expectations, that it's important to know the difference between being humble and between falling victim to the disease to please and always saying yes when you really mean no to anyone who asks. We talk travel, we talk family, his years in baseball, and so much more. So please help me in welcoming Kevin Kuzminoff. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. You deserve to see what you can do in the big leagues. His, wow, his first big league swing is going to be a grand slam home run. Now there's one we'll have to research. First pitch in the big leagues is hit for a grand slam. There's got to be a question whether that's ever happened before. Hi, Coos. <laughs> Hi. Hello. <laughs> Greetings. All right, Coos. So thanks for coming on with us. All right, Kuz, so I'm sure. going to ask you a question that I think most people would want to know, and that is, what is it like being in the big leagues? Baseball, the fans, the money, the perks, the glamour of it all, what does that feel like? Um, well, boy, I mean, it started early on. Of course, when we were all kids, we want to be astronauts or professional baseball players, you know, when they ask you that in kindergarten. And, and you know, I happened to be a decent player in, in high school just because of the hard work that I put in. And, and I got no college offers after um, after high school except for one, a junior college in Arizona called Coaches Junior College. And, and so I got to college and I started to get a little bit better. And my main goal was just to get drafted. And I just wanted to get drafted, play one professional baseball game. And then if I got cut or, or, or if anything happened, I could say that I was a professional baseball player. And so once I got drafted, now, I kind of treated it every day as, as my big leagues, and I was emphatic with my training and my diet, and you know, so all this hard work that built up to my first day in the big leagues was 
was a um, a huge accomplishment for for me, for my family, everybody involved. You know, I was very lucky to have a good support network in my corner. And so I not only felt like that I made it to the big leagues, but I felt like everybody around me made it to the big leagues. My parents, my hitting coach, and everybody supported me. The, the, my friends who reached out to doctors when I needed some doctor support. And and so with the hard work and the support that, that I got, I almost felt like I deserved to be there. Right. Now, I was excited, mm-hmm. and I'd love to be there. I mean, it was like this is a great opportunity, you know, but it's like this is what I worked so hard for, you know, for so many years, and it was, it was so rewarding. And it was being from a little town in, in Denver, Colorado, 30 miles west of Denver, and, you know, playing in the big leagues is just pretty much unheard of. I mean, it was it was great. It was, it was, it was an unbelievable experience. You know, if I played one game, it was just like when getting drafted. If I played one minor league baseball game, I was a professional baseball player. If I played one game in the major leagues, I was a major league baseball player. So it was, it was, it was pretty special. Was it fun? <laughs> was it just like un, un- No. No? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It was fun. Yeah. It, it's, it's tough work. Yeah. You know, we go to these baseball games and we see the players standing out there and yeah, some are making millions, mm-hmm. you know, and, and some are getting the perks, perks that, you know, we were talking about. And, but, you know, at that level, when you're getting paid and the pressure to perform is on the line, I, I, for me, you know, I did feel a little bit pressure to perform. And, um, then you bring the media in, the cameras, all the fans, the scrutiny, you know, and so mm-hmm. it's, I mean, now it's, now it's go time. You're on TV and I think you got to really lock in your game. And, you know, that's just the way I was wired. You talk to some other players and they're just like, ah, who cares? What's the worst that can happen? Yeah. You know, right. but me, I want, I wanted to do well right. because I trained so hard to get there that, that since I trained so hard, I wouldn't accept failure. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, did you, too, but, did you feel, yeah. did you yeah. feel when you were younger in your career? That if it wasn't for your hard work, that you wouldn't be where you are. Do you feel like you were gifted, or did you do you feel like you weren't? Like you were natural at it. No, I was not a natural. I really had to work at it. Um, I I was second team all conference in high school just because I worked with my father. I mean, we are seventy five hundred feet in Evergreen, Colorado, where. It, we get a lot of snow, a lot of cold, so we had to figure out a way to get better. So we'd rent out the racquetball court at the rec center and, and get a you know soft touch machine, machine and hit baseballs in there. I mean, we did everything that we can to maximize my potential. And if I didn't do all of those things, I would never would have made it. Sure. When did you come to know you were done? Like, when did you decide it's time to hang up your cleats? Um, I finished with the Texas Rangers in 2014 and a month into the season um i i hurt my back and i hurt my back many years prior to that i just continued to get worse and worse and worse and i was trying to beat out a ground ball at a shortstop playing in oakland and my back just it just went and i knew that there's something seriously wrong and so i flew to la got a surgery six weeks into my rehab herniated another disc mm. below the level that I just had operated on, go back to LA, get another surgery, um, and never responded well to the surgeries. And I kept going to rehab, kept going to rehab, I wasn't getting any better. And one morning, um, my alarm went off to go to rehab and I shut my alarm off and went back to sleep and I knew right then and there I was, I was done. So I want to give an example of my back pain because I can empathize with you i don't i don't think i've ever said this on here but I, I remember when i met you for the first time i i told you about it obviously adam knows very well i make a massage yeah. me all the time um but so i have scoliosis which is curvature of the back uh, of the spine and it's in my upper back thoracic area and i have back pain every single day i always i describe it as though someone stabbed me with a knife and broke or like an ice pick and broke the you know tip off of my back and just left it there I mean, it never goes away, that chronic pain. So with that, how do you live with chronic back pain and like still find the energy to share your light with others? Because I mean, you're one happy dude. Like, 
I've heard stories about you just through Adam, and I've seen your Instagram, just how you mess around with Nick. And I can, I mean, you want to bring up the, you want to bring up the donut story, how you yeah, bit each donut? I, I know. I always told Austin, I'm like, I'm like, Kuz is one of my like favorite teammates. Obviously, we we're locker mates. But I mean, I mean, you were honestly one of my favorite guys I got to play with. Even yeah. even though I was a pitcher and you were a position player, you yeah. were honestly one of my favorite dudes. Yeah, no, of all the players I've ever heard from, <laughs> yeah, no, of all the players I ever heard from, um, you're definitely the one he talked about the most. So with that, I mean, between all that pain though, like especially during ball for you, especially, how did you find the energy to just? Through that pain, how did you find the energy just to wake up every day and give that smile to everybody and just and play a game? I mean, because I know it made you stop, but just today, how do you carry through that? How do you move through that pain every single day? Well, actually, all the smiles and all the jokes, it's just a front. So, <laughs> Is it? <laughs> oh, no. Well, Astrid, you're, you're right. I mean, back pain is real, yeah. and somebody who has never had back pain um, every single day, 24-7, mm-hmm. like we do, it's, Draining. it can really dictate your attitude on a daily basis and really affect your life. Yeah. And for me, it's like, I mean, is it a lifestyle? I, I don't know if that's kind of, kind of bullcrap to say, you know, like to accept it, you know, but I've accepted it that it's going to be there. And I don't know if that's, if, it, if it's the wrong mental mindset to be in where, no, I'm not going to accept it. I'm going to beat it, you know, and I'm going to beat this back pain. And eventually I'm going to allow my mind to allow my body to get better, sure. you know, with pain. Um, but it's just been going on for so long. It's very hard to wake up and have that positive outlook every single day. And But, but you, you know, back pain so well. is... <laughs> it's, you do it so well. Uh, what's that? And no, you do it so well. And, and I always tell Adam, you know, it's... It's just like life, okay? So this is just to give you an example of the way I kind of deal with it. Because, I mean, it is. It's draining. And Adam knows. It gets me in an agitated mood some days, especially by the end of the day. Yeah. Um, you know, you wake up, you're feeling pretty good. And once you get moving, it kind of warms up. But by the end of the day, I'm like, gosh, I, I'm dying. Um, but the way I describe it is uh, just like life. I say in any situation, it's like if this pain was to last forever, right? Which it is. <laughs> I feel like it is. What do I need to uh, like have to be able to just move through it every single day? Because I have to deal with it, right? I mean, I could sit here and honker into the pain and give into it and say, gosh, like, you know, blame everything, right? P- blame the pain and, and say I'm miserable because of it. And then I'm going to just be, be in that place every day. I'm going to be that miserable person every single day. But if I say, what do I need to have to really move through this every day to accept this? Well, I'm going to need to have some patience, right? I'm going to need to have uh-huh. some some, uh, I guess you could say resilience. I'm going to need to have some of this because it is, it's painful and you just have to, and like you said, you have to accept it. Right. I I think sometimes I have trouble walking, you know, because of my back pain, but I'm still able to walk. You know, I still have my legs and I still have my arms. And and so I think about how blessed I really am. I mean, some people are wheelchair bound, you know? And so, yes, we're all dealing with battles. We all have our own personal battles, you know, whether it's pain or addiction to something or, mm-hmm. you know, but I always try to take a step back and, and look from an outside perspective that I have, I have great parents. I have great brothers. I have a, you know, a good support network and I can still walk. And so I, I try to look at it from that angle, you know, versus then get down. Cause I, I feel like you can get down on yourself and get depressed and then exactly. maybe that can lead to drugs or alcohol. I don't know. I mean, I'm, you know, I don't have that, that kind of personality, but I just try to just realize how blessed I am every day really. And so I just try to keep a positive attitude, good head on my shoulders every day. You know, I guess just simplify it. There we go. Cues, I that like is that. so good. I'm so glad you said that. Now gratitude. That is, that's the answer right yeah. there. I mean, I always say compared to what, right? So you have this back pain. Do you have a doggy? No, there's a piece in his he has a, oh. he has a, he has a Oh, can you guys hear that? Yeah. I'm, so I got a pond in my backyard. There's a bunch of Canadian no, geese. There's good, a bunch of geese that honk out there. I love it. It's candid. <laughs> no, but, uh, no, but going to this whole idea. No, you're right. I mean, it's, it's finding the good, right? It's compared to what? I mean, you can complain about your back pain, but there's someone in the world who has a way worse than you, right? So it's always being in that place. Sure. All right, Kuz, so if anybody was to go onto your Instagram, they would instantly see that you've been to, like, most parts of the world. I mean, you travel a ton. Why do you travel? Uh, 
you know, I was on, always on someone else's watch, someone else's schedule, and, and you know, for baseball, I had to be here at this time, and I had to do this and be here for batting practice, you know, be here at the stadium for this amount of time. I had to change and get warmed up and then go do take flips and batting practice. And during that time, you know, I've always had an interest in traveling, and, I, and I've, I've never traveled before, really. I mean, you know, you went to Mexico or to Costa Rica one time, but I told myself that, you know, I want to travel for two years when I got done. And so a friend of mine is a pilot for United, and he gave me his flight benefits when I got done. And so I was basically <laughs> flying standby anywhere United flew. Nice. We and so, so after that 2014 season, when spring training rolled around uh, in the year 2015, I just, I, I booked a flight to go to Australia and New Zealand. I went with a carry-on backpack with some clothes, had no clue what I was doing. I landed in Melbourne, Australia, didn't know where to stay, didn't know how far the town was from the airport. I mean, I was literally lost. <laughs> and I kind of like that uncomfortable feeling. You know, I like yeah. being uncomfortable like that because <laughs> you can wake up every day, go to work, you know, you go to lunch, you come home, you eat dinner, you go to sleep, and you wake up and do it all over again. You kind of fall into that routine. And, sure. and, I was, and I was doing that, and so I wanted a change. I wanted that uncomfortableness, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, um, and once I took that trip, I just, I kind of fell in love with it. And so I, I just got the bug to just keep traveling as much as I can and keep blowing my money. <laughs> but, uh, um, but, um, money on, though. Yeah. there's a, there's a big, there's a, there's a, so many places to see out there. You know, I know a lot of people don't want to get on a plane for 10 hours and, but that's what you got to deal with. You got to deal with a 10 hour plane ride so you can get somewhere and enjoy it. You know, I mean, there's some really, really great places that I love to go back to, you know, and I'm so glad that, you know, I went, I went to Macedonia. I went back to my roots, you know, and right. I saw some that. friends back there that I connected with many years ago and, you know, saw where my family was from. And, and it was just, it's just a really great experience. I think once you start traveling, I, I mean, I, I got addicted, you know, and I, I want to keep traveling, but it's, I also got to hunker down and start making some money. <laughs> so, yeah. So now, yeah. so now that you've been to so many places, uh, different places across across the world, and met so many different people from different walks of life, what would you say is the common factor between us all as human beings, no matter our heritage, our religion, status? What do we all want? What's the commonality? Is it love? Is it connection? Like you've met so many different people between everybody. What have you noticed that everybody has in common? You know, well, I can tell you what a big difference is between the United States and other countries mm -hmm. is, you know, we have, you know, we have family here and we go over to our parents' house or family's house for dinner, you know, it lasts an hour, you know, maybe a couple hours and, and, you know, and then we're off, you know, we're going home and, uh, the, you know, the United States is a powerhouse. We're so competitive, you know, every day we wake up to compete, to make money and almost like we're, you know, Adam, you know, you're, you're trying to throw strikes and try to fight for your life to stay on that mound, just like I, I am in, you know, in the batter's box trying to fight yeah. and stay alive, you know. Mm -hmm. But then you go to other countries and these families get together and sit around these tables Mm -hmm. And I mean, they talk and eat and drink wine for hours, mm -hmm. you know, and usually they don't eat till later at night. And it's like every single night, you know, and I kind of wish we had that more of that in the United States where, you know, where we get around and we sit around the table and just talk and put the cell phones away and just kind of unplug, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I found that when I traveled, I mean, and I've been in some really shady places and I've gotten lost where people have been very kind and got me back on track to where I need to go, you know, back to my accommodations or getting back on the right road. And so some countries are better than, than others, but, you know, for the most part, I feel like there's some really genuine, nice people out there that treat you like a human being, you know, and, and are willing to help you, you know, I think because we get caught up with the survival here and just the competition in sports and work and paying a mortgage or a car payment, you know, I think we kind of lose yeah. uh, that, 
that human connection. You know what I mean? Absolutely, um, and that's why I asked we the question. So, we get so yeah. tunnel focused on sure. just our. We're in our own butthole. What Jack, Ashi always says, we get in our own butthole and we don't think about other people. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, because you know when you yeah. travel, it opens your mind. You know, it, it it really forces you to go outside of yourself and really, like you said, have that connection. And I mean, my parents. I mean, my parents don't even speak English, so I I grew up in a different environment. Um, and I grew up, like you said, we all had talks at the table. It was like, like my father would be like, don't speak English here. You know, we are in a, in a family here and we practice our language and our heritage. But I feel like, and you're right, when it comes to Americans, for us, I know I'm second generation here. And for us, we lose that, right? So, but at the core of it all, I feel like no matter where we are, we still strive for it. And I feel like there's divorces, there's a lot of disconnection, there's a lot of floating, but at the core of it all, in the in that that deepest part of everybody, they all want. That's why I feel like even social media exists, right? We all want to be connected. We all want and seek love. I mean, would you agree with that? Maybe in different parts of the world, you feel it more, you see it more, because they're they're not as here we're desensitized, desensitized here desensitized. right we keep expecting more here we're we're so determined right we want to we want to live this life that is more than everybody else we always want to chase that dream but i feel like at the core of it all if you were to strip everybody down of the bullshit everybody wants the same thing well i think i think here is it's more of like a simple we if we were we simplified everything it would be a lot easier, but we, I think we, we, as a United States culture, we mm-hmm. want more to connect more. And I think if we just stripped everything down, right. we would connect on the easier. I just think we've piled on a lot of shit That's here. what I think. Yeah. That, yeah. You know, I mean, I always say like a child, we're born pure. And I feel like in different countries, they don't have as much influence exactly. as we do here mm-hmm. of all of that. I mean, would you sure. say? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And whatever your, you know, foundation is, whether it's, you know, God or, you know, faith or, you know, I think, I think, you know, love, I mean, I went, you know, going back to earlier about, you know, my family, I mean, just, I'm so close with my family and, yeah my parents and my brothers and so there's just that strong love there and that's kind of like you know my foundation i can always you know back up and lean on my family for support you know so i think it's very important and i'm very fortunate to have that absolutely absolutely that's your center is that is would you think that's your macedonian culture or do you think that's a little bit of as a person or as a family um I think as a family, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm third generation and so I'm, I don't speak the language and, but, um, I think it's just the way my parents were brought up and the way they were brought up and, and, and so maybe it has a little bit, you know, a little combination of both, maybe. Sure. You know, I mean, we had family dinners every Monday night where we talked about what we learned at school and, you know, yeah, so goals so, and what, you know, that type of stuff. It's so bled through for sure then. Having that, they've it's definitely come, it's transcended through for sure. All right, so visualization. I want to talk about visualization. Adam said that there is a practice in baseball where you all would visualize, in your case, hitting the ball and executing it. Adam would be throwing the ball and getting it in that in that zone. It's something that I feel like Adam and I do every morning. We meditate and we do manifesting, and it's kind of the same thing. It's visualizing. We visualize what we want to see for our day. We visualize what we want to see happen. And so my question for you is, do you, that practice of visualization that you learned in baseball, do you carry that into today, into your days after baseball? Do you still visualize? You know, not as much, you know, because my my biggest goal was to get drafted and make it to the big leagues. And when I went to sleep every night, you know, I put some soothing music on. And actually, Adam, I, I did the same thing as you. I mean, I did a a lot of visualization, a lot of imagery, mental imagery stuff. And I think that carries a lot of weight because I feel like you can only throw so many flat grounds, so many bullpens, mm-hmm. you know, and you can only hit so many baseballs before you just kind of wear out, you know? So I think you can give yourself a mental workout as well. And I think it's very valuable, but I've gotten away from it. It's kind of sad to say, um, but in my career, early in my career, it was every day for me. I mean, I lived it, I breathed it. I, it, I mean, it was, it was constantly in my head. And so if there are any kids out there listening, I highly encourage them to sit down for, you know, five, 10, 50, whatever it is, minutes a day 
and just visualize yourself stepping in that batter's box and getting a good pitch to hit and hitting hard and hitting over the fence and hearing the crowd, mm-hmm. you know, and, and imagine yourself running around the bases or, or, you know, stepping up on that mound, you know, yeah. and, and and you get set, you know, and you and you you hit your location, you know, whatever it is, whatever, whether it's baseball or surfing or become a lawyer or a doctor, you know, I think it's all very, very um, valuable. Right. I actually just saw this interview, and I agree. I, I feel like for us, it's the same thing. It's almost like our anchor for the day. Kobe Bryant, there was this uh, interview they did with him, which, again, I'm not I'm much of a sports person, but I actually watched this. He said it's his anchor. I mean, he meditates every morning, 10 to 15 minutes a day, and he says it, it sets him off for the day, but in a way where he's in control of the day and doesn't allow the day to control him. Now, we can't control what happens, but we definitely can control the way we react to it, right? So how we handle it. Sure. So he says by meditating, it gives him that control, that poise to be able to take on whatever comes as it comes and whatever challenges come along that day. And it, it, it's a, he's able to kind of anchor himself, you know, by meditating other than just floating through his day. And then, you know, we talk about this all the time. It's like sometimes we float through the day, like there's different ways to meditate. Like it's not doing yoga. Right. It's not us sitting there, uh, you know, oh, do the breathing like, no, it, it's meditation should be different for everybody. I feel like it's more of a connecting with that grounding, that appreciation. What do you think? Love. What do you think going to the gym every morning? Maybe for you? Yeah, I mean, that could be a meditation. Would that be a form of you like just, you know, like I know with me, it was just a routine. Like I go to the gym mm-hmm. and I, it was a way for me to block out the rest of the day and focus on myself. Exactly. Yeah, I would agree. You know, and and. I mean, other side, I just, I, I would feel better, you know, throughout the day. I don't, I don't feel guilty about skipping that workout. Like, right. Adam, if you'd skip your bullpen or flat ground because you were lazy that day, or I guarantee you were guilty if, if you were to skip a workout or skip something that can yeah. make you better at your craft, you know, and I felt the same way, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, to even go on the fact of visualization for, like, the kids out there, like, I used to visualize me, like, one of the favorite stadiums that I wanted to go pitch out of and come out of the bullpen was Yankee Stadium. Mm -hmm. I wanted to come out of that because I remember videos of Mariano Rivera, the guy with the most saves ever. And I, and I can, I can Mm -hmm. think about that now and almost get goosebumps because of that, that feeling that, that overwhelming. But I think it's that feeling that you have to go for and you have to visualize those, those feelings of you running on the field, running on the grass, getting on the mound, like almost make sure you're almost there. You have it. You're in possession of it. Right. But without going too far from what Ku said, I mean, just for anybody who isn't in baseball Mm -hmm. or isn't in that, like he said, even a lawyer, a doctor, anybody else that just in general, I feel like, like you said, you want to almost go to that space in your head where you have it already, yes. right? It's just a, it's, it's a routine. It's just doing it every single day where you have that anchor. Sure. It's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Not just waking up, jumping out of bed, and then getting to your day with no direction. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So I want to talk about competition. And, and not in the way that uh, you might think or most might think. I want to talk about competition in a way of basically giving a shit about what people think about you. So looking back at other people. So for you as in baseball, but I think in life in general, and I describe competition like a race, okay? So you're, you're starting this race and you take off running, you know, life. I, I say the race is life. So you take off running as fast as you can. You wanna be successful. You wanna, you wanna move in that direction. But the moment that you stop and you turn around and you look at everybody else to see where they're at, that moment robs you of the time that you could have spent running forward, that energy that you spent giving that to them, you could have given to yourself to get to that finish line faster, right? So that's how I describe life. So with that, were you that way in baseball? Would you say that you dedicate your success to to essentially never looking at other guys' stats? You stayed focused straight ahead and not gave a shit about anybody else and what people had to say, the fans, like the ones that were against you, the people... Would you say you just stayed laser focused ahead, or were you the guy that that didn't that kind of got caught up with with the chatter, if you will? Well, I, I think you want to try to steer away from comparing yourself to other people. Mm-hmm. I think maybe it might be natural. Sometimes I caught myself comparing myself to other people, and it doesn't matter what other people are doing, you know. And so I remember training; I was always in competition with myself. Can I can mm-hmm. I push out one more rep? You know, mm-hmm. can I get faster? 
you know, or if we're in elementary school or high school and worry about what other people think about us, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, it doesn't matter what other people think about us, but I guess that's part of growing up, you know, looking back at high school, I'm like, why would I care what these people thought about me or I want to ask this girl out, but I was too scared. Like, it's not that big of a deal, you know? Yeah. And, but I guess that's just part of growing up. But I think sometimes, I don't know, you talk, talk about other players and, and, but some of the other, other players where I think God just said, boom, Mariano Rivera, I'm putting you on his plan to become a baseball player. Exactly, not because right? he didn't have to, not, not because he didn't have to work at it, yeah. you know, but maybe he, some of these guys were born with some special talent, yeah. you know? And so since I wasn't, and I got so deep in my head with training, and I got so emphatic about it, you know, maybe I did start to kind of wander a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, sometimes it, it can kind of compromise your training, your, your playing ability, you know. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. It doesn't matter what anyone else is doing around you. It's all, it should be about you inside and your, you know, your your drive, right? It's, all, it's so easy to say, though, right? You know, like, you think when you're... Yeah, a lot easier said than done. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I think that being aware is important, right? You yes. want you don't want to think you're running this race against yourself. I mean, you want to know that there's other competitors. But what I'm saying is that the moment you stop and you turn around, I mean, it really robs you. It, it messes with your head. I mean, it messes with your head. Uh -huh. It slows you down. All right, cool. So by definition of the world, you are successful. I mean, you had a good career in, in baseball. You made it to the big leagues. You're an entrepreneur today. I mean, to most, they'd say you're living the dream. But from the little bit that I know you and just hearing stories about you, and I think anyone who knows you personally, your family and friends, they would agree that your biggest success is just you being yourself from the inside out, right? So you're this happy guy. I mean, I've already mentioned it. But uh, how did you get to be this guy, that free spirit, you know, traveler, just a funny dude? How did you get to be this guy? Well, I think there's more to life than baseball or... Or, or you know whatever you do I mean baseball is just just such a, a small frame of time mm -hmm. in my life you know and and I, I my my first thought is you know my parents you know they always raised me to say thank you and please and you know just be polite and um, and I wanted my parents I think to be proud of me that's one of the reasons why I want to make to the big leagues because my parents spent so much money on these baseball camps sending me to Arizona and Florida the day after Christmas when I didn't want to do it, you know, but I went anyways and, and getting me a car and driving these tournaments, you know, I mean, they're really, really supportive. And, and so they, I think they raised me to be polite and, and just be a good human being. And so I, I got it from them, you know, it's, it, it's all them. You know? mm -hmm. so. That's their heart. <laughs> yeah. I know. I always saw, I mean, when I was playing with you, I mean, I always saw your front, every time we were in New Mexico, um, in Albuquerque, your parents, because I think that was the closest drive for them from where what, where you are in Denver to New Mexico. Uh -huh. And they were always yep. there. I'm like, man, that's cool. I mean, his parents, I mean, you're in your 30s, you know what I mean? And, you, and your parents were still coming to your yeah. games, and I thought that was pretty cool. Right. Um, yeah, it is. And I could feel that you it had is. a huge, your parents had a huge influence in your life just by, just by seeing that from the outside. Yeah, real good conditioning. Yeah. Yeah. My mom, my mom's a real sweet lady I mean she's the nicest lady in the world and it's like I'm, I'm very blessed to have her and then and my father is he's tough he's a man's man he he's 66 years old he still likes to fight you know he doesn't take shit from anybody you know and so maybe that's where I get the fire from my dad and I maybe I get the smiles from my mom that's you awesome. know but that's a good balance um, that is a good balance yeah yeah right no, it's true. I mean, I, I think for both Adam and I, we could say the opposite. You know, we kind of had both. Well, I mean, Adam had a really good upbringing. I feel like your parents were were good parents. Uh, for me, it was dad was absent and in and out. So I think that if you're not conditioned the way you are to be a good person, then we always have a choice, right? So we could always change mm -hmm. and, uh, and learn from people like you. I, I think that's why I was most drawn to you because I was... I was just drawn to you how optimistic and, and just what a good guy you are. So, good to have Well, you. thanks. Thanks for that, that <laughs> very nice to say, you know. And, and I think, you know, what I was just thinking about when you were saying that is, is, you know, we keep relating back to baseball because baseball is a big part of our life and maybe it's a foundation that we can build off, just like you were talking about, Adam, at the beginning. Of and um, baseball is so tough and the motivation and the drive and the determination and discipline you have to have and being in that spotlight and just, you know, being under that pressure and, you know, experiencing that, 
I, yeah, exhausting, exactly. And and experiencing that, and then now being out of the game, I feel like I kind of took a step back. I'm able to breathe. I'm able to get oh. deep breath, you know. And it's like so now it's like it's not. It doesn't need to be this serious. We can have fun, you know. We can. Mm-hmm. You know, we can we can have fun and keep things loose. You know, I feel like a lot of people are so uptight nowadays, and so sometimes they'll be sarcastic with someone. Just see what kind of reaction I get. See what kind of type of person they are. They can laugh about it, or they take it the wrong way. And yeah. you know, and especially in the clubhouse. I mean, boy, there's a lot of stuff that's said and done in the clubhouse that would not fly. You know, if you talk about that in the gym, or you do that in the gym. You know, and so, so I, I feel heard. like we've been exposed <laughs> to a lot. Yeah. <laughs> No, so. it's the. I mean, the clubhouse is another. That's another. That's another part of the game. Like, I always tell Austri that I don't miss the game that much anymore because it was so exhausting. But, but it was the. It was everything else. You know, it was the the relationships that I built that were the biggest part of what I missed today. I would agree. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. All right. I would agree. <laughs> So there's this phrase that I learned from Adam, speaking of the clubhouse, but uh, from baseball, which is big leaguing. Uh, For those who don't know what this means, basically when uh, when someone feels like they're above somebody, right? So when you're too good for someone, yeah, that guy big leagued me, he didn't get back to me or, or whatever it is. Why do you think guys get so high on their own success? Maybe money changes people. Yeah. Sure. You know, maybe it gets to their head and uh, someone hasn't humbled them or maybe they forgot where they've come from. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe they've forgotten their foundation or that, that, that base, you know, and but I don't know, you know, I mean, it's, that's a, that's a really, that's a really good question. You know, I've seen money change people. Um, but I think importantly, you got to just remember where you come from, you know, and, but then again, you have all different personalities, right? And, yeah. and I, I don't know, that's, that's a good question. That might be a better question for a for psychologist or something, yeah. but, um, you know, maybe, maybe egos, you know, maybe, cause I feel like everybody who's successful has, has some, maybe some enemies because they made somebody mad along the way for them to be successful, which is fine. Mm-hmm. you know maybe it means you're doing something right you know but I feel like maybe to be a successful person you have to have a little bit of a, an ego maybe a little bit of an egomaniac kind of like a maybe like a like a hunting you know strong stern uh, even though I you know you say this is the wrong way I'm going to do it this way type of attitude and that. I don't know. That's that's a good question. I can't really put that into words. I mean, just for myself, like, because I've tried to like think about this too. Because even after baseball, it was just funny because it's like with you know your own industry within your own, uh, I guess you could say brotherhood because you guys become all like one. But when Adam was done with baseball, and um, he's like he's reached out to some people, and he's like they never got back to me, and I'm like oh they big league deal, you know. But uh, I always, right. it, it, you know, I always try to I'm like why do people do that because. I mean, if you really think about it, I mean, I don't know if it's fear. I think that it might come from fear because I feel like at the end of the day, you value most what you're, what you're most scared of losing, right? And, and if people fear losing this or whatever, not, not upholding this status, if you will, right? With that comes that ego. And, and I think a little bit of, of it is necessary. I'd be a hypocrite to say like, you don't need, you know, any of that for the game. But I think that at the end of the day, it's just understanding that we're all, we're all human here. We're all, you know, in the same boat and we're all, we're all experiencing the same life, right? So like, how are you above? Like, here's the thing. You guys have a job. It's just glamorized. Like I, I've met people and they're like, oh, you dated a baseball player? I'm like, no, like I dated a guy, you know, and he just happened to play a game for a living. And with that comes everything, which is fine. I mean, it is what it is, right? But at the end of the day, if you realize we're all, we're all on, the same, on the same path, you know, you got a fireman who does something honorable, you know, you got veterans, you got all these people that just, you know, risking their lives. I think that if anybody just stays in that mindset that, that there's no way you, you can be not humble, right? They're, they're so human beings. And, and sometimes even people across the world, like you said earlier, Kuz, they're all sitting there living a life where they all sit down and talk at the table, right? They all, they're all living this life where it's sometimes like they have that understanding of, of just being, you know, connection. connection. 
Yeah. Yeah. I always, I always thought, you know, the the higher paying job you have, the more stressful a job it is. Mm-hmm. You know, I always thought that, like, well, it always, you know, it depends if, you know, if you want to make a lot of money, you're going to have a stressful job. Maybe, you know, being a brain surgeon or, you know, being a baseball player where you are in the spotlight all the time, you know. I mean, going back to getting big league and, and maybe people changing is, you know, I guess to stick up for athletes or someone who's in a, you know, high profile job is you're also getting pulled mm-hmm. in all different directions. Mm-hmm. You got to meet an interview here and you got a, a card signing yes. here and you got fans wanting you to sign autographs. If you don't, they're going to bash you on Twitter, yeah. totally. you know, and they understand like we have a job to do, totally. you know, and it's yes. like we have to find out what's, in, what's important and, and what's going to benefit us for our job because that's, mm-hmm. It should be the most important. No, you know? I agree. I agree that there shouldn't. So, for example, I always say this, right? It's like the disease to please. There are some people that are on the other end of the spectrum. I mean, they say yes to everything and everybody. Um, and that's not what I mean. I mean, the people that sometimes are within your own, you know, like like I said, Adam. You know, Adam will come and he'll be big leagued. Um, and you know this guy's not, you know, he, you know he went through the same years. He's not asking for anything. But they're also, like you just said, there is that other spectrum. They are uh, being pulled in so many different directions. And you can't say yes to everything, right? You can't be that guy. Because right. then you're, now you're just being submissive to the, the disease to please. I mean, you can't be that guy either, so... Yeah, you, you start doing a lot more and trying to please other people because you want people to like you, and I've been guilty of it a couple of times, you know. And, and well, sure. I believe I, I believe exactly what Koo says. It's a, after a while you get you get exhausted, but I know I know when I was playing, you know, Ashu kind of kept me grounded. So one time he was walking out of the stadium. We were both walking out of the stadium, and then this kid came up and he was, was like, "A hey. kid or was a card card guy?" Oh, it was a card guy. This card guy comes up to him. He's like, "Hey, can I get this signed?" You know, and uh, and Adam's like like just starts like getting a smug and adam was full of himself yeah. at the beginning he knows it i don't have the time for those people yeah he was like, well, he's, like well, he's like they're just gonna sell my card on ebay and i'm like well isn't that a good thing you know isn't that and i was like, I mean, like it's right. not that bad i mean you're getting yourself out there so i don't know i mean to me i feel like there has to be a balance like you said you can't be the guy that says yes to everything but at the same time finding that middle ground is just, I mean, I feel like that's the answer. I, I, to I think that's a challenge. I think that's a challenge with a player. I think a person in career, mm-hmm. I think in your regular life, it's like, who do you say yes to and who do you say no to? You mm-hmm. know, I mean, I think that's the, I think that's the balance of life anyway. I mean, I think mm-hmm. I, we deal with this in real estate all the time is like, when do I respond to a client and when do I, exactly when do I, you know, when do I hold off my family? You know, yeah. I think that's when, when you're playing ball, it's like. Exactly. Here's the thing. That's the biggest thing. If you saying yes will deprive you or pull you in a direction that's now affecting you, then no, that should be a no, right? Because if it's going right. to start to deprive you and affect you, then that's not a healthy thing. That's mm-hmm. where the balance, that's where that line is drawn right there. So, there right. And if somebody hates you for it, I think you just have to learn to, you know, deal with it. Very. That's not a little oh, like absolutely. you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I talked about this on here and without going too much into it, because I still have some other questions for you. But uh, no, I talk about it just as a woman. OK, so in a workforce, I, I've, I mean, Adam's well aware. But as women, a lot of men I've had encounters or just the situations where I've where I, you feel by default that you have to say yes. Right. Because they're asking for you to do it. And it's like and not sexual things or anything of that nature. But I'm saying just in general. And it's, I call it the disease to please. And I feel like when I don't feel in my heart, where I don't feel like it's going to be for the better of myself or for them or for whatever is better, no. Like there's nothing wrong. And you cannot feel that guilt when you say no. There's nothing wrong. And they may get pissed off and they may you know, talk, but it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, if you're, you're in it with yourself, then you understand that that no came from a good intention. Sure. Yeah, I agree. I get deep. I get deep, Kevin. <laughs> that was Sorry. deep, Oscar. That was, that was great. <laughs> I enjoyed that. Oh, God, no. So I what, mean, how am I supposed to follow that up? <laughs> no. What, what, Cruz, what's your relationship with failure? With? Failure. With who? With failure. Oh, failure. With Becky. Um, with Becky Cruz. <laughs> How's your relationship with Becky gone? No, 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 no. What's, what's your relationship with failure? It usually involves me banging my head against a cinder block wall. (laughs) 
No, we don't get along. Is that with you or Becky? (laughs) Both. (laughs) Uh, Well, you know, boy, playing baseball all those years, and baseball is a failure sport, you know. I mean, if we're good, we're going to fail seven out of ten times. Adam, as a pitcher, I don't – I mean, that's just from a a hitter standpoint, position player standpoint. I'm not sure what it is on a pitcher side, but, you know, a lot of these young kids get so down on themselves because they are, you know, they don't walk away at the end of the game with, you know, a couple hits or something. And these kids have to realize that it's a failure sport. And I knew early on that if I put the time in, you know, I'm going to have better luck. I'm going to have better opportunity and good things are going to happen. I know things aren't always going to go my way. We talked about what we can control, you know, a few minutes ago. I'm able to control my training and my mind and working hard and training gave me that confidence and that competence to go out on the field and feel good about myself that I can handle this. This is what I've trained for, Mm -hmm. you know, but realizing also that you're not going to get the job done every single time, you know? And so, yeah, you know what? I failed, but you know, I also can't look back and regretted missing that training session or missing that bat speed workout that I should have done or, or not lifting those weights. You know, I mean, sitting here talking to you guys, I can honestly say that I don't have any regrets. If, if, if I had any regrets, it'd be I worked too hard yeah. because I wanted it so bad. Ooh, that's, what Ashi, that's what Ashi said about me. That's no, I, it's true. So when Adam was in baseball, he would, you know, it's funny because he would tell me, he'd be like, you know nothing about baseball. And I'm like, I don't, <laughs> but I know about life and I know you. And I would, I would always see him. And I always say, don't confuse working harder with progression. Right. So you have to work hard at the right things. And Adam would he felt like, look, life, you can't control the outcome. All you can control is your reaction to it. He would get in his own head and think if I work out harder. Right. Which, by the way, was making him buffer, which, by the way, was making him tighter. Right. So but I look good. You look good. You look good. Yeah. No, I mean. But it wasn't serving. <laughs> so, uh, but it wouldn't serve the intention that he had, which was to be a pitcher, which entails you being, you know, loosey goosey. You got to get it in the zone. So, and Adam was obsessed with this idea of throwing really hard. He'd go out there, and right away he'd be like, "I want to throw harder, right? I'm, I'm that guy." That's the story he told himself. I'm the guy that throws really hard. But in that story, he forgot. Who told me he had to really hard too? No, you did. You did. You did. <laughs> yeah. But but you you didn't trust that. I know. I know. You didn't trust it. You had to trust the fact that you were just the guy. But I I see Adam today stronger. You know everything more because I feel like from that he's grown and like you said, Coos, you would never regret anything you've ever done. But just you grew from that place, right? You you learned the lessons. That's how you became who you are today. Well, well and, I think uh, I think he grew from that. I mean, that's why you like you said earlier in the conversation. You yeah. travel. I tell Austin now, like everybody's like, do you miss it? I'm like, no. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't. But you know, because I don't want to be. I was controlled by everybody. Like yeah. I had like just like you said. Yeah. Five o'clock, I had to be here. Mm-hmm. Three o'clock, I had, to, I had to throw. Two o'clock, I had a bullpen session, and it was exhausting. I think, you know, me personally speaking, and um, it could be different for other guys, but I was never satisfied as a player. I was never satisfied with my training. I was wanted more and more and more. And so, Oscar, when you're talking about Adam, mm-hmm. how he – you know, wanted more and more and more, throw harder, harder. I mean, Adam, you did throw a freaking cast, dude. <laughs> and, and we, I think, I think as, as a competitor, you always want more, right? We can always get better. We always want more. And, yeah. and, and I, I felt the same thing, you know, and so I would maybe overtrain sometimes and not rest when I needed to rest, you know, mm-hmm. and so I can feel for Adam when he says, you know, when he, because I remember, Adam, you know, after every game, you were in the weight room. You know, you're on the treadmill, you're lifting weights, you're doing that, you know, the band, that big big rubber band yeah. thing that's six feet long, you know, doing all that stuff. And, I yeah. mean, your dedication was, I mean, I felt like you and I were the only ones in there after every single game, you know. Yeah. And that's what it takes. And I feel like, from my perspective, you should be able to live on that side of things versus going on the other side where you didn't get in there on the treadmill and do your band work and do your weightlifting after the games. I feel like you should be able to 
be happy that you put everything you got yeah. by training so hard versus having regrets not training so hard, you know? And, and my thing, you know, was I'm going to give it all I got, you know, so I don't have any regrets. And if I don't make it, I just, I just, I couldn't make it, right. you know? Mm-hmm. And, but I can't blame it on the process, you know? I can't blame it on the work, you know, or the lack of, of work that I wasn't willing to put into, you know, if you're not willing to train hard and push yourself and train the right way and you go out and you fail, yeah, you should have no reason to get upset. You didn't put the work in. You know, and, and so I'm coaching at Metro State here in Denver, which is D2 school, and I go down there every day and, and a lot of these kids get pretty upset. I'm like, what are you upset about? Right. You're, not, you're, you're not putting the work in. You know, you don't want to listen to me, what I have to say to help you with a baseball swing and how can you get mad? You shouldn't get mad. You, you haven't even put the work in yet, you know? Yeah. And I get passionate about this because I constantly hear, you know, these these kids and from these parents and these little camps and these lessons like, you know, oh, oh Kevin, man, I, I could have been a Major League Baseball player, but I was too short. Oh, really? Well, look at David Eckstein. Yeah. Look at Dustin Pedroia. Like, I, I'm sorry, but I can't accept that as an excuse. And so I always want to err on the side of, you know, doing the work versus on the flip side of, you know what, I didn't do enough and, and have a regret. So I think we want to do more and more and more. And, I, and, and, you know, but I think there's a right way to go about it too. So here's the thing, work as hard as you can and then let go. And I think that magic comes when letting go in the sense where you work as hard as you can. So Adam, like work as hard as you can. I mean, he overworked, right? And that was fine by me. I mean, you know. I never, I never turned it off. I'll go home he and never. Yeah, exactly. So my, my whole idea is this, is that Adam would work as hard as he could. Then when he'd get out there, he never trusted that all his hard work was going to come through. So he, then he would be out on the mountain. He'd try to control everything. So I feel like at some point, you have to, and I, I'm with you, you have to put in that work. I mean, you've got to be that last guy and you've got to be that first one and you can't, you got to get uncomfortable, right? Because so many people are avoiding discomfort all the time and we're teaching our kids to feel entitled to just have it, mm-hmm. right? Like it's just, you're just entitled to it. And that's, that's not true. That's not, that's not life. So we always say work hard. I mean, even in real estate, we work. I mean, you know, like you've, I don't know, people have seen, they're like, damn, you guys work all the time. It's like, yeah, like what, how else are we going to get it? Right. You got to get after it. But, but at some point sure. you got, and then we've learned this with people. We work as hard as we can. And then at some point we have to just let go. We're not going to go to client's house, put a gun to their head and be like, buy this house right now. You know, like we've got to, we got to trust. We have to trust that all our hard work. All of our following up with these people is going to come through. They're going to like us and we're going to get the deal. And I feel like it's the same with baseball. You do the work and at some point you got to let go and you cannot feel guilty when you go to your kid's birthday party. You know, you can't feel guilty. I never miss any kid's birthday. I know, but you know what I'm saying, babe. You know what I'm saying. It's like, stop bringing that up. <laughs> no, but Adam would put this pressure on himself would he, where, where he would feel guilty if he missed a day. So you got to work as hard as you can, but if you miss one day, it's all right. You know, you got to trust that at the end of the day, all that you are that guy that you, you work really hard. Right. So that's, that's what I'm talking about there. It's just finding that, that sweet spot of like not being on that other end of the spectrum where you're lazy and you feel entitled and you never want to be uncomfortable, but then being on the other side too, where you work as hard as you can and you just let go and Mm -hmm. you trust, you trust God or whatever you believe in, you trust the process that whatever hard work you've put in is gonna is gonna work for you, right? Yes, sir. Otherwise, why do we do it? Right. Why do we work yeah. so hard? Yes, sir. Yeah, you gotta you gotta trust it all. All right. So to wrap this up, to quote you because I watched one of your interviews that you did with the Rangers uh, a few years ago, actually your last year, that hitting is contagious. We start getting some hits, and together, good things start to happen. And I love that you said that because Adam and I live by this. We we talk about this contagious personality right so we are all responsible for who we show up as every single day and that's why i say you are one happy guy right you you choose every morning to be this guy and that's in, like that's infectious like you are contagious to others i mean i'm telling you, you walked into that coffee shop instantly i'm like i gotta smile like this guy's making me smile so it's a very contagious thing but the opposite is true too if you're having a crappy day if you are this person you're you're contagious to your kids you're contagious to your parents you're contagious to everybody around you and i feel like we're responsible for that as who we show up 
So, you know, tying this back into baseball, how would you say that that whole contagious uh, principle or practice, if you will, affected you guys all as a team? Like, you guys all had a vibe together, right? Sure. You know, and, and we are a team. I mean, I think if, if every player or every individual does their job and everybody thinks that, then I think, you know, everybody comes together as a team. I'm not talking about being selfish. I'm just talking about that if everybody thinks that their performance will affect the outcome of a game Mm -hmm. and we all put that together, I think good things can happen. You know, my dad always used to say, if you want to be enthusiastic, act enthusiastic, you know, I guess it's like you wake up in the morning, you stub your toe and it's like, oh, today's going to be a shit day. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, change it around, you know, Mm -hmm. and you have the choice and to so, change it. You're right. And I, I think the reason maybe why I said that quote is because I didn't know what else to say. No, I'm just kidding. I, <laughs> I, um, just I do honest. believe that it's contagious. <laughs> you know, maybe Adam, as a, as a pitcher, when you're just fucking pounding the zone and you're just striking guys out or ground ball, you know, you, we can't get anything started, can't get anything rolling. Now we get a hit, you know, and then yeah. now somebody else gets a hit and it just starts to oh, roll. And it's like, it's oh, fun. oh, oh we, 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 we can do this, yeah. you know, and so probably why I said that it, it takes somebody or maybe a couple guys to spark something to take the initiative and be like, all right, here we go. You know? Mm-hmm. And, and, um, I don't know. I've just always liked that, that term contagious to as a team, get something started, you know, because I don't know, maybe it's like throwing a no hitter, you know, it's like, man, you're, you're in the zone, you're, you're pounding the zone, you're getting out, you're getting ground balls. There's no momentum, yeah. you know, on the other side. You know, maybe momentum. No, I mean, also. I mean, like, like, you, I mean, you were part of a no hitter. I mean, it's just like uh, once, once you get going, and that team's behind you. You know what I mean? Like you're behind you. It's it's a whole team. It's contagious. You know, and then as the game starts going on, you're like, hell, we got something going here. Yeah. And it starts being contagious, uh-huh. and the guys start working a little harder. You know, diving some balls, and all of a sudden. Everybody's making gold glove plays in the in the infield, you know what I mean, or in the outfield. So it, it's a, and I think that's where Ashri brought up the brought up the whole statement is that things are contagious. You know, once we get going with something, it's you just got to keep it going, and every, everybody around you starts catching in. But it's all about your personality. Sure. No, I call it flow. I don't know if you know who Steve Kotler is, but he works with uh, athletes, but extreme athletes, so like skydivers, guys like that, who just like find. Uh, just life out of, you know, that kind of facing death, you know, type of uh, sport. Um, But this guy talks about flow and he says that with teams in general, like just with athletes, you guys get into flow with each other because we all can access it. It's it's in the, I'm going to get a real scientific here, but it's in that frontal cortex, that front part of your brain. It it shuts off, right? So like uh, the chatter, Uh like the stories we talk, everything shuts off. And then you're just in this zone, like you said, you're in flow and then that becomes contagious to each other right so it's that energy that you guys all share as a team and then and then the fans get into it right so then it becomes this big old ball of energy and flow and you guys are all into it together so right but yeah. it's fun it's fun it's fun and I, I know i know we're talking a lot about baseball but i guess i'm when i'm thinking about this when i'm talking about baseball you can translate this to life so it's sure. not just on a Absolutely. baseball team but if it's being contagious where you're you know being a good attitude so someone around you you know picks up on that Absolutely. you know what i mean so as i know we're talking a lot about baseball but i do think it translates into life you know whether it's working hard you know having a positive attitude you know i mean i think it all it all flows Sure. This whole podcast, by the way, is literally because of this. So we are in tier design. I do interior design. Adam does real estate. But we say our motto is home is the root of the soul. So the reason that I do this is because I feel like you just said this applies to life. So who do we see every day, you know, as moms? Because a lot of our listeners are moms and dads and, and a lot of times, you know, young professionals, millennial parents and who we show up as in our homes is how we affect so I always say like our house is four walls or five walls, however many walls, right? It's plaster, it's tile, it's this, it's a house, it's a structure. We make it home. So that whole theory has been always swirling in my mind. We make it home. So whoever we are in our homes is contagious to our kids. The words that we say sit on our walls. You know, we create this warmth if we wanted to. And then when people come in, they feel that. 
Do you know what I'm saying? Like, you ever felt like you come into someone's house and it's, like, cold? And you're like, dang, this isn't, like, I don't know. It just doesn't feel. It's because they've created that within their own home. Or when, like, uh, you're at a dinner and people start to argue, like, a couple start, and then you feel awkward. You know what I'm saying? You feel the tension between them. Uh That's what I'm talking about. It's contagious. We all have that. Mm -hmm. So I feel like we're responsible for that. And that's why I praise you so much. I'm sorry to give you a big head, but I feel like uh, (laughs) that choice that you make every day to to just bring that smile forward and, and especially in your pain that the pain that you're in because i can empathize with that um the fact that you still are able to bring through just such a good personality man that's that's honorable so well you mentioned earlier you mentioned home yes. and house yes and i think if if the difference between the two maybe is you have a home where it's from the heart and you have that that comfort within a home and the mm-hmm. house is just maybe the structure maybe Absolutely. you know what I mean Absolutely. so when you say home it just feels more of like a personal yeah, yeah. lovey feeling Heck yeah. You know? when Adam was away I always said Adam was home so you know it wasn't necessarily even the structure it could be in a memory it can be in a, in a child it could be in a for you it's your parents I feel like you were very very at the end of the day you always come back to your parents in the sense of like that's home to you. That's where you go back and say that they, they did so much for me. That's home, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, no, absolutely. Right. It's what we bring to our homes. All right. So one yeah. last question. We're moving in. I know this is probably one of the longest ones we've had. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry about that, but uh, it's real good stuff. Um, so one last question, and I'm going to tell you this, okay? You might get stumped because I ask everybody this question. Everybody get stumped on this question, but I I do this because I feel like in the end, it always turns out to be the best answer we get. So, Kuz, what do you know for sure? Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Now you're getting deep on me. (laughs) (laughs) This could be about anything. Um, That the sun is going to rise in the morning. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, gosh, I don't know. No, that was a a fantastic. I told you. It's always the best answer. The sun's going to rise in the morning, no matter what. That's so good. That's it. I don't need anything more than that. So good. I love that. Cruz, you've been so awesome. I appreciate you. Adam appreciates you. Yes, sir. Um, no, I, I hope, you know, and it's like I said, we can talk about baseball, we can do all this stuff, but at the end of the day, um, the reason we do this is because I feel like I want to take different people and ask about their experiences and always tie it back into just life. Mm-hmm. And it always does. Right. Somehow, some way. So we appreciate you. All right, Cruz. All right, you guys. Yeah, that was, that was fun. Thanks a lot for having me on. That's the stuff that I haven't talked about in a while you know and it was kind of it was kind of nice to get out there hopefully maybe one kid or parent mm-hmm. hears at least one thing that you guys or i said that can hopefully help them or help their kid that'd be cool you know Absolutely. we appreciate you thank you for tuning in good vibers and be sure to subscribe to good vibe sunday by downloading the podcast app found at the app store catch you all next week